Hey, 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 everybody. Hey, it is nine o'clock in the east. It is six o'clock in the west. I am Reed Galen. Joining me tonight are the one, the only Rick Wilson. Rick, welcome to the show. Hello, brother. And Simon, Simon, as always, welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm, I'm great. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right. Absolutely. And, and, and I will tell you this, guys, for anybody who um, sometimes feels a little bit down, <laughs> there is no one better than Simon Rosenberg to make you feel better about how things are and will be in the coming months. All right, guys. So it is Super Tuesday, uh, 15 states across the country, uh, Republicans, Democrats, everybody in, in between voting. Um, what's interesting, Rick, here is that we already know the outcome, not only of sure. tonight, uh, but we know the outcome of these primaries. Uh, so tell us, why does it matter? Why is everybody all at Twitter? Why is why are all the cable nets wall to wall until one o'clock in the morning like they try to get you to do? Why is everybody so <laughs> excited if we already know the outcome? Look, we understand that Donald Trump's going to win this primary. We've said it for two years. Um, we understand the MAGA base better than a lot of the people that report on the MAGA base do. Um, the reason we're following it tonight is that Nikki Haley, although she is not going to win the primary, although she is not going to to to, to have some miracle pull off tonight and then win a state and charge her or her engine up again, she continues to pull approximately 25 to 40 percent off of Donald Trump's number. Those people are telling us a very clear signal. They are not comfortable with Trump. They're not happy about Trump. Now, look, will many of them come back and vote for Trump? Absolutely, they will. But there are an awful lot of folks that are, frankly, uh, telling us tonight with the exit polls and some of the early outcomes from the states we're seeing already that there's a discontent inside the Republican Party. The base is fractured. And it is. And again, while many of those people will go back to Trump, the number that are available to be persuaded not to vote for Trump or to vote for Joe Biden, I think and I think Simon and you would both agree is larger than it's ever been. Well, and so, Simon, before we went on, we were doing a little bit of a, a, a tiptoe down through the, the history yeah. books here. And you referenced um, the the Kennedy Carter primary of 1980 yeah. with a with an incumbent president. Um, and then 1992 with George H.W. Bush and Pat Buchanan. Yeah. And, you know, it's it seems interesting to bring those up. But frankly, at this point, Trump is a functional incumbent. Yep. So take it in the context of that history. This does not seem like good news for him. Yeah, I mean, I have this view that something really broke in the Republican Party when Dobbs happened in the spring of 2022, that it was for too many Republicans. This was just a bridge too far. It was too much and that MAGA had been crazy and scary. But, you know, this made it much more material to large numbers of Republicans that something had really gone wrong with the Republican Party. And what we've seen since Dobbs is Democrats have repeatedly overperformed expectations and polls and Republicans have struggled. And I we know in the in 2022 that the very trumpy candidates in all these battleground states failed to bring their coalition back together right they bled republicans some of them stayed home some of them endorsed democratic candidates but we couldn't have gotten up to 59 percent in, in colorado and 57 percent in in pennsylvania and 55 percent in michigan if we didn't have republican votes behind us in those states and so there has already been a splintering of the republican party and i think we are seeing as rick said i think it's growing I am shocked. I will be honest with you. I have been really surprised at the, the reservations, the clear reservations that we're getting, particularly in the polling in the early states. And what's what's important about the early states as opposed to national polling is the people mm -hmm. in the early states have had candidate time. They've had ads. They've had to actually go through the process right. of really thinking about things. So they're actual voters. They're not people being polled. And so their, their understanding of the race is more sophisticated than just an average Republican who hasn't voted yet. And this willingness of Republicans to either not vote for Trump or to vote for Biden, which is extraordinary, is been surprising to me. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's further evidence of how much the Republican Party, I think, has already splintered. Yeah. How big that is. Is it 5% of the national vote, 6%, 7%? We're going to find out. But if you just look at New York three a few weeks ago, right. as an example, in all those public polls in the final week, right, Swazi was up two, three, four points. He won by eight. And that's a sign, again, that if there is and he some a big chunk of that thing that pushed him into the high single digits were Republican voters 
crossing over and voting for him in the in the in the special election. So if there is four or five percent of the national electorate is available to us and, and we can go get that, that turns a race that we're down two to a race we're up, you know, two to three. It turns a race that we're up by two, three or four up to seven, eight or nine. Right. These are the stakes on this are very high. And the, for all the for anyone who's looking for warning signs about the weakness of the Trump candidacy, they're there to be seen. Right. Money problems, the indictments of leading Republican officials, the turmoil in the RNC, you know, his him burning through cash at extraordinary rates. All of this stuff, if you are a political professional, what you're seeing there is weakness, struggle, all sorts of warning signs. Panic. Right? As a unified party behind him and is looking and it's got tons of money. And so the contrast between what's happened with Biden in these last few months and what's happened with Trump, I think, is very significant. So, Rick, let's let's go through the states as, as Simon was describing them, because sure. I think it's important to understand this, too, that that the people who are voting tonight and have voted so far are not general election voters. They are oh, no. primary voters. Um, they are primary in, in the case of Trump. They are primary Republican voters in states like Iowa and South Carolina. Right. Where in Iowa, 23 percent of the people that said that they they'd caucused for Haley said that they would go all the way to Biden in a general right. election if she weren't the nominee, which take it for what it is. It's it's Iowa. Twenty five percent of South Carolinians who mm -hmm. voted in the primary said they wouldn't vote for Trump. Sure. Uh, there was a survey out the other. It was a yesterday. I think I saw it was uh, I think somewhere out of Florida that one of seven pro Republicans right. polled said that they wouldn't pull the lever for Trump. And so explain to, to the audience a little bit, okay, if, if you are, we talked a little bit this about this on the LP podcast last week, if you're sitting in Mar-a-Lago, like, how do you how do you put Humpty Trumpty back together? Well, I mean, look, I think all the warning signs, all the flashing red lights on the cockpit panel are telling us that, that you know, they're going to have to very quickly make a deal with Nikki Haley, bring her back into the fold. That's going to be very difficult, not because of Nikki, she'll... She will, I think, break everybody's hearts. Folks, don't think she's going to not endorse Trump in the end. I think we all agree she will. Um, but convincing these voters now that that Donald Trump has changed or that he's somehow matured or that he's going to stop the, the, the craziness, none of that's going to work with these folks. They have made a decision. And remember, as you pointed out, these are Republican primary voters. These are the most intense of the voters. Folks, we score elections we score voters on a scale of one to five and people that vote in a presidential primary are probably going to be fours or fives and in terms of the voter intensity so these people pay attention they know the stakes they're informed and and the fact that you had so many people turning out for haley sending this message over and over again as we say all the time in 2020 depending on the state we modeled between three and eight percent of our of those republicans to persuade them to vote against trump in 2022, our model improved, and we got it up after Dobbs, frankly, to between 7 and 11 percent. Right now, we think that that's going to continue to expand. We think the Haley um, results, we think that the, all the data we're seeing in the exit polls and of people saying, no, I'm done. I'm not voting for the guy. That was a forbidden line in 2020. No Republican would have said that in 2020. None. They would have been like, oh, I'm, I'm with Trump. I'm with Trump. And... These people are smart, intense, informed voters, and they're telling us very clearly that they're willing to go away from Trump, to walk away from Trump. Nikki Haley was a good but not great candidate. She was, but she was somebody who a lot of Republicans were expressing their discomfort by supporting her up until this point. Um, and that's going to be a really interesting, um, it's going to be a really interesting outcome, how they react as she you know, bows to her own political imperatives and says, ah, I'm going to endorse him after all. And Joe Biden's a communist or whatever she says. I think it's going to it's going to really alienate a lot of those people and make them even more gettable because they're going to learn very quickly. There is no safe harbor in Republican candidates and, and the party right now. It's all Trump all the time. And if they don't want that, they have to pick Joe Biden. Well, can I add oh. one thing to that, Reed? Is yeah, that, please go ahead. What, what's also important about everything that, that Rick's saying is that in the last few days, both Donald Trump and Laura Trump have said that they don't welcome the Haley voters into what? the Republican Party. Right. right. They I don't mean, want Mitt Romney. Okay. You know, I mean, you, you know, they, right. He lost last time. So he needs to actually grow votes. And if they're telling 15 to 20 percent of the current 
Republican electorate to get out of, you know, to go support the other guy. I mean, it's it is arguably the most idiotic thing that any of us ever seen in our lifetime. Right. And it's a sign, I think, of Trump's ongoing diminishment, his impulsivity, you know, this kind of wild stuff that he's coming up with. Right. Because he is actually a diminished figure from where he was. But I want to be very clear about this. In the last few days, the nominee, the, the, uh, the Republican Party said the people who are opposing him in the primary are not welcome in the Republican prime in the Republican Party under him. So what are they going to do? Right. I mean, what are you, he's being they're being told to go vote for Biden. And I think this opening that we have, this is real. I mean, this is they are not going to pull back. I think from this kind of outlandish statements they've been making the last couple of days. Somehow, I think what's going on is that Trump actually believes these polls showing him ahead. Some of the polls, some of the, we had two very good polls for Biden today, right? Some of the polls showing him ahead. I think Trump thinks he's already won the election and that he can, and then he's, you know, he's so crazy, right? That he's now doing really, really crazy things that are undermining his own ability to win. He's making the kind of mistakes that candidates make when they lose, right? And so, it is so. It's just shock, it's been shocking to me how the the Trump campaign is handling this stuff. Their their strategists must be freaking out, frankly, about the. So that I'm Rick, about. Rick, think about it. in In 2022, remember, famously, uh, Carrie Lake, crazy Carrie Lake in Arizona, in her run for governor, said, "If you're a McCain person, if you're a fan of John McCain, get out. Right. I don't want you." Right. And what does she do? She loses by what, two, three percent to yep. Katie Hobbs. Yep. Right. Like this stuff all matters on the margins. And, yep. you know, if if that were the margin that of the people that could potentially get him over the line, he's now told them, you know, go screw. Yeah. I don't want you anymore. And, and, you know, and what, frankly, a, go ahead. Go ahead. That's an interesting observation because Katie Hobbs ran a very low, 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 low key campaign. That was going to be an election about Carrie Lake and her positioning more than it was about Katie Hobbs. And so when she said, when Carrie Lake said, if you're a McCain person, get out, uh, they said, all right, because Katie Hobbs was relatively inoffensive. She wasn't like a firebrand, you know, super progressive. They couldn't right. box her like that. Just as Joe Biden is, I think, going to provide a safe haven for a lot of these voters, because Joe Biden, as much as they want to say, oh, he's a communist, Marxist, social, whatever, whatever, you like stuff from the the nightmare closet they want to pull out. None of it really works with Joe Biden. And I think. Well, he's not. But remember, too, that, and I think the other part of that, Rick, I'm sorry to interrupt, is that unlike 2016 or 2020, right, he's not mythological. Like for Republicans, Hillary Clinton was, was. Oh, somebody yeah. that had been part of their conscious, their political consciousness for 25 years, mm-hmm. right? I remember seeing this in California years ago when I worked for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Even when voters were mad at him, they didn't dislike him, right? And I think that's something that Biden has going for him too, which is, you know, think about and and Simon, I'll turn this over to you to discuss the president. Is think of all of the stuff that Republicans in the House, that Trump, that you know, all the stuff with Hunter. All of the the front groups and everything, all of them have to do this, all of that work to try and make him one one millionth, right, the the terrible person that Donald Trump is every morning when he gets up. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, two points on that. One is I think that one thing that is not getting discussed enough is that these swing suburban um, folks who are, are loosened from the Republican Party are also donors, right? And, mm-hmm. and one of the reasons that the Republicans oh, yeah. are, you know, are struggling to raise money, hard dollars in particular, right, the hard dollar apparatus of the modern Republican Party is in, in collapse right now, is that these folks are, you know, they are the thousand dollar, you know, five thousand dollar donors of the Republican Party. Right. And they're not right. with MAGA. And it's causing this is what happened in the Trumpy candidates in 2022. We grossly outspent. All these Trumpy candidates in the battleground districts and twenty in the battleground states in twenty twenty two on the on the hard side with the candidate fundraising and you're seeing that play out again and I think this is this is not getting enough attention because you know there's one thing if you if a Republican voter votes for Biden right that's two votes right you lose one and you get the other guy gains mm-hmm. one but what happens when you lose a hundred million dollars 
that, you know, is now not going to come to the RNC and to the Trump campaign and potentially 50 million of that goes to Biden. That's 150 million, 200 million dollars. That's a lot of money. Right. And so I think there's also an enormous financial impact and it's further eroding the hard dollar side. The second thing, and I think both of you just alluded to this, is that all the central attacks against Biden are evaporating or have been evaporating, right? The economy isn't in recession. It's really strong. Inflation isn't high. It's now come way down. Crime rates aren't exploding. They're actually coming down all across the right. country. There isn't a war on energy, right? We actually had more gas, oil, and renewables produced last year than any year in American history, making us more energy independent than we've been in a genera you know, generations. Um, you know, the attack on him as being corrupt went up in flames. And in fact, it reintroduced the notion the Republican Party is a tool of Vladimir Putin and foreign hostile powers. And so all they really have left, and then the border, right, which they had clear advantage over on, on us on this, they've misplayed. And now we're the party that want to bring or that wants to bring order right. to the border and they want to bring chaos, right? Talk about impulsive, ridiculous behavior by the former president to take an issue like that and hand it to us. So what do they have left? right, to attack Biden on, it's his age, right? And that's where they're going to go. And it goes into weak leader, strong leader. You guys know this in, in your party. But I don't think, I think my own view is that once the Biden campaign turns on, for real, and we started seeing some evidence in this in the morning council poll today, yep. that you're going to, some of the strong leader, weak leader stuff will be addressed by the strength of the campaign. Because I think some of the weak leader feeling about him in the Democratic coalition is just distance and absence, right? There isn't a campaign. He's not talking to people. He's being president, but he's not getting in their face and social media and all the ways that we have to feel things now, right? And once the campaign really turns on and starts filling up our feeds and we start seeing ads and there's lots of people working, I think it's going to also strengthen him on the strong leader, weak leader dimension, and, and which will then start to also erode and take away one of their central attacks. Yeah. I don't know what the Republicans are really running on this time. And if you listen to Trump, his arguments are the economy's terrible. It isn't. Recession's too high. I mean, inflation's too high. That's not true anymore. There's a war on energy. That's not true. I mean, I went through all this. He's inventing a Democratic Party and a candidate that doesn't exist because right. he can't beat the one that's actually in front of him, in my view. Well, let's speaking of President Joe Biden, Michelle, why don't we go run? Why don't we go ahead and run a spot that Rick and Co created? to talk about what the president's been up to. Decades of leadership, a lifetime of experience, and rock solid determination to rebuild America. Joe Biden's plan for America's economic comeback is working. The highest job growth on the world, inflation coming down faster than any other major nation, the prices families pay for everything from gas to groceries falling fast hope and optimism coming back. His tireless work to build a stronger America means we're respected again. And a respected America is a safer America. Joe Biden's years have taught him leadership, wisdom, toughness, how to ignore the noise and focus on the people. He's a president for every American, making the hard decisions with compassion, heart, and respect. That's Joe Biden, America's president. All right. So, Rick, yeah. we have been on campaigns, the, the, the kind that Simon just described, where the headwinds are blowing on you. Right. And, and the political oh, yeah. headwinds are, frankly, that there's good news about a lot of good news about. So talk a little bit about and Simon sort of laid this out for us. Talk a little bit about what you expect to see from Trump and co, because they have to root against everything. Right. And, you know, this goes back, Reed, to, you know, and you and I have both been through campaigns with Karl Rove, who famously and wisely said, we can't win with just the base. We have to go base plus. We have to expand outside of our base. What you're seeing with Trump and this messaging that Simon very, very accurately described, uh, the economy is terrible and the migrants are coming, all the crazy stuff, that is only playing not only to the base base of the Republican Party, but to the edges of the party, the real weirdos, the hardcores, the QAnoners, the conspiracy guys, and increasingly, even the Fox News bubble is not protecting yeah. those those people from reality because the economy is improving. 
the numbers are, especially in things that, you know, the, the Republicans' big argument about, about, about inflation was, oh, well, people really feel that at the grocery store and the gas pump. Yeah, they do. But we've also seen under Joe Biden massive job growth. And for the first time in 50 years, Republican or Democrat, we're seeing wage growth in the country. And if you don't think people know and see that, you are mistaken. These guys have to run a fantasy campaign about a country that is beset with, with crime driven by immigrants. And, and Joe Biden is a is Joe Biden is simultaneously in their minds a doddering senile fool and a brilliant conspiracy mastermind skimming billions <laughs> off the off of the off of his presidency. Right. It's an as Michelle Obama waits in the wings to take <laughs> over, right? Um, yeah. And she but, said it again. But, she goes, no, also no. Right, no. Um, Simon. I want I want to come back to the thing that that Rick said because you know the one thing that that I noticed is that Fox News has Nikki on. She ha they have Nikki Haley on a lot, and I think we shouldn't forget that like the Murdochs have never liked Donald Trump. Okay. Right. They were perfectly happy to call Arizona for Joe Biden on election right. night in 2020. And they saw what it you know, they, then they got upset and then they got worried. And then it ultimately cost them eight hundred million dollars. Um, but they're, they've never loved this guy. He was a means to an end from them. And I could make an argument just as, as someone who spends more time than I should in the media, that they'd rather have four more years of Joe Biden that they can go whack about <laughs> than four years of Donald Trump where they're got to be for everything all the time. I just think as this campaign unfolds and we have eight months, I mean, the, the things that we're going to be able to run on with him are just extraordinary. You guys have been, you know, you've got long, many years in this business. I mean, we use the term negatives, right, or baggage. This guy has the most extraordinary negatives that anybody has ever run for any office ever, right? And and he didn't win last time. And and just the, the, the you know, so I, I feel – Confident. I mean, to your point, they are putting Haley on. And I, and I think wait till the CNBC starts to discuss what it means that Trump's proposal that he wants to put 10% tariffs on everything. So what it means is that, you know, he got asked about this on Fox last night, I think, about what's his plan to reduce prices in America. And he had no answer. Right. And the reason is his plan is actually to increase prices of everything. That's his mm -hmm. actual proposal by the tariff thing, right? Once we start getting into the granular, you know, the simple arguments that Trump, the stuff he's really for, he wants to raise everybody's prices on everything. He wants to increase the deficit. He wants to cause chaos at the border. He wants to align the United States with a genocidal maniac, Vladimir Putin, and end the Western alliance. He wants to end American democracy for all time. He wants to strip tens of millions of Americans of their health insurance. He wants to round up and deport tens of millions of people who have jobs in the United States today, who are immigrants who work for a living and pay taxes, by the way. And so when you start to really talk about what he's actually for, and this is why my basic assessment of the Trump candidacy is that he's far weaker than he was in 2020. He's far more dangerous and extreme, and he's more dangerous and extreme than a politics that lost in 2018, 2020, and 2022, and 2023, there's no olive branch going anywhere to soften him up. There is no way to put lipstick on the Trump pig here, right? And even the fact that they're playing around with a 16-week abortion ban, I can tell you right now that that's going to be catastrophic for them. And the IVF stuff has reminded voters, if they, yeah. if they were wondering about what their real intentions were, we now have been given a clear signal that abortion was just the ending abortion in America was just the first step. Um, and so I, I just think when you get into the game, guys, when you take the chess pieces and you play the board, right, this guy is a catastrophic disaster. Joe Biden has been a good president. The country's better off. We're going to learn more about his second term agenda in the next few days. I think we have a lot to sell. Your ad was, by the way, phenomenal. I hadn't seen it before. It's terrific. Look at what we have to sell with him. <clears throat> and look what they have to sell with Trump. You guys, if you had the assignment of trying to make Trump look like a presidential candidate, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, no. he, wears more so, so, he wears more makeup than drag queens, right? Like, I mean, we right. can just put out a list. Hey, 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 <laughs> what do drag queens do to you? Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but but Rick, I want to ask you this, because the, the GOP writ large is beholden 
to Donald Trump from a sure. from a from a, in all the places that matter. You know, thirty percent right. for Haley in these states matters, but for the for the parts of it that matter, Trump sure. is in charge. They're beholden to him, and and Trump is beholden to genocidal maniacs like Vladimir sure. Putin and Christian evangelicals, right? Like yeah. they're in charge, not him. The, well, and so, the, talk a little bit about how to to Simon's point about you know you know you, you know tacking back to the middle. There's no tacking here. There's right. only and, one and way I, these people ever go, and it's the darkness. I have to say this. And this is something I'm going to criticize my friends in the in the mainstream media at the, at the Times in particular. Please do not run stories when Susie Wiles calls you up or when Chris Lasavita calls you up and says, or Jason Miller says, you know, Trump's language is softening. He's going back to the middle. <laughs> He's going to appeal to the middle by, by smoothing out the rough edges. Y'all have been doing this since 2015. It has never happened. It will never happen. Trump will always be Trump. He is only and always who he is. And that is a terrible, horrible, monstrous human. And yes, Reed, you're exactly correct. That's a really important point. The Republican Party used to be the, the, the three-legged stool, foreign policy conservatives, fiscal conservatives, and, and social conservatives. Well, now it's Vladimir Putin fanboys, Christian nationalists, and people who are Trump idolaters. That's the Republican Party today. And... And the weakness, again, going back to that weakness of Joe Biden, or, uh, you perceived weakness of Joe Biden, that he's got a divided party. Oh, no. Donald Trump's the one with the divided party. Donald Trump's party is very deeply divided. The Christian Nats want one thing. The pro-Putin people want to re re change the world alliance uh, polarity around. But the Christian nationalists, I think, are the most dangerous for Trump in many ways because – Although Trump tried to walk back the the uh, in vitro fertilization ban stuff in Mississippi or in Alabama, the rest of the base of the party and the Christian nationalist side love it, and they're going to push it and push it and push it, and he will always do what the base wants in the end. All right, and Michelle, why don't we go ahead and play the ad that we put up? I think yesterday, Rick. On uh, yeah, we wanted a family, children, a legacy, a life. My husband was in it with me every step of the way. IVF is hard, painful. We invested all we had, put our whole hearts into it. After years of disappointment, we believed our dreams would come true, that we'd be blessed with the life of our child. Now, it won't happen, because Republicans are putting an end to IVF and fertility treatments for women. They did it in Alabama. Soon, it'll be everywhere. They're telling doctors it's against the law to help us bring a new life into this world. It wasn't enough to harm women who weren't ready to be a mom. Now they're coming after women who are actively trying to be one. Republican men like Donald Trump and Mike Johnson aren't just working against women anymore. They're working against life itself. Our dreams of parenthood shouldn't be casualties of political battles. So, you know, I mean, Simon, you probably have many friends like this. I mean, we have as a family several friends who whose children are are only with us because of IVF, right? Yeah. And, you know, to you know, to to your point about Dobbs and, you know, this continuance, um, you know, and it, it was Dobbs and then, you know, I live in Utah, right? They had these trigger laws. Most of them have no exceptions for rape, incest, life of the mother, um, all of that stuff. You know, this is one of those where even, you know, somewhat conservative women or I'm going to say conservative people. And Rick can speak to this, too, in a minute. Like we still have that vestigial sort of like libertarian thing in the back of our head. Right. Which is yeah. like, yes, so maybe abortion is the issue. Maybe, uh, you know, th these issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis a woman's freedom to choose are the issue. But it really comes back to individual liberty. Right. Which is now you have the government and unelected judges telling you what you can and can't do. I mean, I listened to Nikki Haley talk about this the other day, and, and it was so interesting because she said, you know, it shouldn't be up to judges, right? We should let the people decide in the states. And then, but isn't that what it used to be, that the people got to decide, right? I mean, it was, it was pro, being pro-choice means that you actually want people to decide and not government and a woman and her doctor. And, and you, you heard her her whole argument unraveling. And then the commentator after she left said, didn't she sound like a pro-choice advocate when she was talking that way? Right. And, 
And it's why you end up in this crazy place, right, as Republicans or or the Trump and the MAGA folks on this stuff, because it is actually bananas what is going on here. And it's medieval. And it is, you know, stripping the rights and freedoms away of more than half the population. By the way, as countries like Mexico and Brazil and Argentina are expanding options for, you know, creating more pro-choice societies. The French are, just and, put it in their constitution. Yeah, put it in their constitution. But I mean, even heavily Catholic countries nearby are now moving Ireland. In, a, in, a, in Ireland in a far more liberal position on this issue than the United States. And and so, listen, I think this is all comes down to this basic reality that, you know, I, I said part of the reason I got the election right in 2022 is that I argued that the Republicans had made this huge strategic error that oh. after losing in 2018 and 2020, usually a party pursues a different politics than just lost. And the Republicans didn't do that. They pursued MAGA. And now they're double MAGA, triple MAGA, super MAGA, MAGA on steroids. And it's a politics right. that's already been rejected again and again and again. And if you were worried about MAGA before, your reasons for worry now are far greater. Right? Ending democracy, further erosion of, of fundamental rights and freedoms, right? Crazy economic policies that are going to destroy the global economy and all the things that have made us wealthy as a nation, subservient to uh, somebody who's been trying to undermine and attack the United States for, you know, for, a gen you know, our, our arguably our most single significant global adversary, right? Not just that Trump is going into league with some other country. He's going into league with the country that has been our greatest global adversary for the last 50, 60 years. These are unsustainable things. And I think one of the things I'm very interested in seeing in the polling is whether or not, Trump, you know, Putin has a 5% approval rating in the United States. Trump is about to meet with Orban on Friday to get his marching orders from Trump's emissary, I mean, from Putin's emissary who's coming to Mar-a-Lago on Friday. I wonder about the older Reaganite Republicans. And I was just about to ask Rick about that. Yeah, I mean, what's going to happen? You know, again, you talk about peeling off 2%, 3%. I have to believe that at some point, or or is some of Haley's vote, you know, that we're seeing some of these older people who are proud of Ronald Reagan, proud that he ended the Cold War, proud that he sure. defeated communism, and who are now watching his their party, you know, give away the store to the people that we defeated in 1989. And, and and Rick, this is one thing I want to ask you, and then we're going to run a spot about this, is to Simon's point, right? Like, I, I was a kid during the end of the Cold War, right? Yep. But Red Dawn, even when I was eight, was yep. like, I loved that movie. As we but call it in my household, just, the documentary Red Dawn. <laughs> the documentary also known as Red Dawn. Um, but I think it's something bigger than this. And, and I think, you know, something that we should probably spend a little bit more time about, which is... Republicans traditionally love America. They, they are proud not only of America, but to be Americans and America's place in the world, as yeah. Reagan said, the shining city on the hill. And what Trump and his people tell us is, hey, you're not that great. You're a bunch of losers. We're a bunch of suckers. And that's not how I think Americans want to see themselves. You know, Americans have a, ha have a deep, sense that the values and the and the system that we built here as flawed as it can be in many ways is still superior to autocracy oligarchy kleptocracy dictatorship and all these things and and you know what they're right to think that now what we've seen develop in the republican party is a faction led by people these hyper nationalists these hyper populists who believe that the the real model for america to follow is not 240 years of tradition and constitutional law and development, but the, the 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 iron fist of a Vladimir Putin, the iron fist of a of an Orban, the system by which they are able to produce in in the minds of Republicans, you know, the in the minds of Republicans, Russia is a good country because it's it, it doesn't have gays, it doesn't have black folks, it doesn't have anything any of that diversity problem. There's none of that wokeness there. Well, there are also people who go to a funeral and get their images captured by the secret police and get kidnapped today. That's going on right now in Russia. There are people in Russia who are political opponents of the president who are poisoned and murdered. This is a this is a a, a country in alliance with a, and this is this blows my mind because how the MAGA's process this cognitive distance, I don't know. Russia 
is in a new alliance with Iran and China. Now, I was told by the Republicans that Iran and China are bad, but at some point, I promise you, if Trump's elected again, he'll say, Xi, very strong, we understand each other, we like each other very much. And I also- he still believe- remembers that beautiful chocolate cake from the- Mar-a-Lago <laughs> all those years ago, Rick. And, and the mullahs and I, the, although the Trump Tower Tehran is delayed, it will be excellent. I mean, it, it amazes me how little they understand the world, but they, they, the, the, the part of it is just this like defiant disorder where if Joe Biden and the institutions of the world want something, they hate it. And they, they, they want Russian tanks in Ukraine. They should just be honest about it. And, and I so, think, and I think guys, one thing I just want to say about this, and I, and I, I've been in talking to people in our family about this is that, as you all know, at the end of the day in the election, there's going to be two, three, four core things that are going to really drive sure. everything, right? And a part of the process now that we're all in is this distillation of what's happening down into simple things. I think we all need to do work around how to describe Donald Trump, the traitor, Donald Trump, the betrayer of yeah. the country. I, I don't I don't think we have the right language, because when I try to write about this, for example, I feel like words like treason and traitor are overamped you know they're almost you know it's like a bridge too far i don't and I, the way i often write about it is he's betrayed the country that's not strong enough though and it's not and so we have work to do i think to figure out how to really in simple plain english to describe mm-hmm. to the american people about how much he's really betrayed serially betrayed the country and is planning to do so again he doesn't want to make america great again he wants to make russia great again and you know it is and this is an indisputable fact at this point, right? And and I think that we linguistically, look, I think it took a long time for us to describe, you know, we don't have a long history in American English of evil political figures in our in our past. I think it, I don't think we could point back to a Hitler who had existed in our society to say, you know, this guy is like them. And we've struggled linguistically in American English, I think, to describe the extremism and the radicalism and the you know the authoritarianism that we're seeing, we have a lot of work to do in the next few months about how to really distill this thing down into a couple simple things that we can say. Because I think these are not just motivators for Democrats, they're disqualifiers for a lot of patriotic Republicans who want better for their country. And, and I think when they come to really understand how much he's already betrayed the country and how he's willing, he's promising to do it again, I think it's going to be a serious problem in, in, uh, for him. In the well, election. Simon, in our research, we've identified what we call the, the Red Dawn conservatives, and they are late boomers, Gen yep. Xers, early millennials who remember the Cold War, who remember Reagan, who remember Russia, who understand a little better, I think, the historical context of, of the oppression that was Soviet communism and why Americans stood the line for 70 years in order to overthrow it. And, and that's so, really and, the, the fight that's playing out in Ukraine right now. Yeah. And so let's go ahead and run, Michelle, the Ukraine spot, and then we'll talk. When Vladimir Putin invaded a peaceful Ukraine, his brutal shock troops committed hideous war crimes against women, children, and the elderly. He bombed cities, towns, and villages. America and the world gave Ukraine weapons, supplies, and intelligence. The Ukrainians put their courageous soldiers in the line of fire. With great sacrifice, this alliance broke the invasion, pushed it back, liberated millions. Victory for Ukraine is in sight, but the war isn't over. And the new front is in Washington, where mega Republicans want a Putin victory. They'll cut off aid to Ukraine if they take power. You heard that right. They want America to switch sides, help Putin win, threatening us with nuclear annihilation. It's sick. It's wrong. It's MAGA. If they win in November, Putin wins, and the blood will be on our hands. The Lincoln Project paid for and is responsible for the content of this advertising. Got a lovely voice over there. So, Simon, um, let's let's talk about the Democrats that now. Yeah. Um, you've got President Biden, um, who's presidenting. Uh, you've got his <laughs> campaign. Um, you know, I think Rick and I are, you know, congenitally... Um, you know, programmed. Well, I guess if we were programmed, it wouldn't be congenital, but we want action. We want noise. We want punches and we want them yesterday. Bias for so tell us, 
<laughs> right. Me too. Bias for bad. I like me, that. Me too, so, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so Simon, tell us, tell us how you see, you know, things coming from the president's side, because this isn't going to be a fight in a vacuum. And I think we should note that even with all the things we're saying, we shouldn't be surprised that it will be very close. And this will be a very hard election right down to the end. You know, I think my explanation for where we are right now, and I don't know that this is true, but it's sort of the way that I I see it, is that Mm -hmm. I think the Biden world believed the general election was going to start now, after the State of the Union, after Trump won all the primaries, and that there was a, a limited utility in them engaging in the way you're describing up until this point. And that the way we know that, for example, is that they didn't do very much to generate democratic turnout in any of these Super Tuesday states, right. for example, right? They weren't they weren't engaging. And I think they made a strategic decision that we'll we can question or debate for the next 25 years, right? About you know when this thing was all going to start and turn on. And they made a decision to turn it. I think it's going to start, you know, I think it's basically turned on now, right? I think that. The State of the Union is the beginning of the general election campaign. Trump has, you know, solidified his hold on the nomination, although Haley's being annoying. And, um, you know, there's enormous weakness. But I think on our side, this is, you know, you're going to see a dramatic scaling up of the Biden campaign. And I also think the Biden campaign has been raising a lot of money. And I think they feel a little bit more confident now about spending now. Right. Given given the expense of running a presidential campaign, a a general election campaign for eight months, I think there was a a little bit of concern about building this whole thing so early and maintaining it right over time, just the cost of it. And I think they made decisions to turn on parts of the campaign and not turn on others. I think all of that, you know, they just announced in the last 10 days, they've announced really major and important hires that are in, integral to the operation mm-hmm. of the campaign. So I think we're going to start seeing, um, you know, a much more, you know, I think the thing that we all have to be impressed with, I think, as professionals, is that their uh, rapid response team, their digital rapid response team. Really is, picked up. Yeah, is jumped really up, good. Uh, yeah. Jumped up a lot of notches. Yeah. Right. And they are good. And, you know, they are pioneering new stuff. I mean, these little quick 15 minute, I mean, 15 second videos that they're doing, these quick clips, this is kind of new stuff for us in the game, right? And this is stuff that can translate over to TikTok and play in Instagram and play on Twitter, right? I mean, the design of them are all cross-functional across all social media, right? They're not really long videos. I really like what they're doing on the digital side. But I think all of us feel, I, I think we would all feel a lot better if we were feeling the campaign more than we are. I, and, and I think that because I think we all recognize that Biden is an average communicator, let's say, and that therefore the campaign is going to have to do more than a traditional campaign, certainly do more than campaigns that were headed by Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, who were exempt, you know, extraordinary communicators. Extra gift, yeah. Extraordinarily yeah. gifted, yeah. Took up an enormous amount of space, right? Biden is an average communicator, and and I and I think it means that the campaign is going to have to do more than a t- than a recent Democratic campaign. The good news is we're going to have a lot of money, and as I've talked about and written about so much, is that the Democratic grassroots, the machine that we have as the right as the Republican hard dollar machine is atrophying and crashing and stumbling, our hard dollar machine mm-hmm. is more powerful and bigger than it's ever been, and we not only have you know, millions of people giving money, giving our campaigns more money than they've ever had. But we have all these volunteers who are, you know, postcarding and texting and remote phone calling. Um, You know, Tom Swazi, you guys saw this, right? We made 2 million phone calls into Swazi's in in five weeks into a House special election, right? 2 million phone calls, the kind of calls you would make in a general election in a major battleground state, you know, 20 years ago, right? So, the scale of the power of our grassroots now, which is independent of any candidate, it's it's there to fight MAGA, right? And it doesn't, it's immaterial who the candidate is. It keeps showing up. One of the reasons we keep performing at such a high level is that we now have hundreds of thousands of proud patriots who love their country who are not going to let democracy slip away on their watch, right? And and I think it's yeah. given us the most powerful political machine we've ever had. And that's why I think. Swazi race, that's a three point race, becomes an eight point race, right? You know, at the end, because we're just reaching so many more voters in so more, so many more compelling ways than we ever could before under the old politics. 
And I, and I'll just say this and then, and then I want to, we'll wrap it up and let everybody get back to their evening um, is that, you know, I, I've traveled the country, um, you know, in the last few years. And to your point, Simon, there are hundreds, if not thousands of groups that most people have never heard of. Yep, uh, they are all overworked. They are all under-resourced. They all do incredible things, yep. right? Uh, for a, a simple belief system, right? And it, as, uh, as everybody's heard me say, we don't have to agree on everything. We just have to agree on one thing. And these groups have all taken that to heart. And I think you're absolutely right. And so, you know, as we wrap up here, um, you know, Rick, why don't you let everybody know where they can find you on the interwebs? Um, all right. You are, you are I am, prodigious I there. Am. I am at the Rick Wilson on Twitter, the Rick Wilson on Instagram, and the Rick Wilson on Threads, where you will find much more cute pictures of my pets and my <laughs> fiance than like ranting political stuff. But you know, you might enjoy it. You never can tell. Um, also, I have the Enemies List podcast, and I am on Substack at the Rick Wilson, and in all those places, um, come out, interact. We like to we like to talk. Hey, read one more thing I wanted to mention tonight. You know, sure. it looks like Donald Trump, he will still win um, Virginia, but it looks like he really underperformed in Virginia, especially Northern Virginia. Haley got 35% of the vote out of Virginia right now, which surprises me because Chris LaCivita, his Trump's main consultant, is like the Donald Trump of, of Virginia politics. He is a guy who had this dominant position in Virginia politics for years, you know, gave George W. H. w. Bush the swift boat ads against Kerry in Virginia. It didn't seem like he really turned it up for uh, for Donald Trump in the same way. Well, no. And just to think back to 2021 and the uh, and the Yunkin race, I wonder, Simon, just briefly, I know we've run over time a little bit, whether that means that some of those soft Republicans, you know, that were friendly to Rick and me who voted for Biden in 20, maybe they crossed it back over to vote for Yunkin are now sort of saying, you know what, Yunkin was a moment in time. They were upset about schools, right. whatever the case might be. But like they're not going to go back to Trump. Well, listen, Youngkin had a had a very disappointing uh, election just a few months ago, in right? I mean, right, in yeah. twenty three, right? I mean, he went all in. He poured tons of money in. He designed the campaign and the strategy around the fifteen week abortion ban, and he got his mm -hmm. ass kicked. You know, and I think that was a big deal in Virginia politics. I mean, I think there was a real weakening of that kind of politics. But I want to just remind your viewers that. Trump is leading in national polls against Haley by 62 points. Right. So in Virginia, he's going to win tonight by 28, 30 points. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, as you guys were saying, I mean, like, I know there are lots of people in the national media claiming that this stuff doesn't matter. Well, they're not people that have worked on campaigns right. <laughs> oftentimes right. because, you know, underperforming the national number by 30 points in what, you know, was up until recently a battleground state and a state where there's a Republican governor that's not a good sign. And so, I, you know, I, I, I think that it's a good way to end. Thank you for bringing that up, because I do think this basic dynamic that we've seen in American politics since Dobbs, where Democrats have overperformed and Republicans have struggled. We saw it in 2022. We saw it in 2023. We're seeing it in early 2024. MAGA is broken, broken. It's a you know, it's it's a bridge too far for even lots of Republicans. And Joe Biden's been a good president. And so when I see all that together, I am optimistic. I'd much rather be us than them. And if you want to follow me, you can find me on Substack at Hopium Chronicles. It's a wonderful community of people. I, I publish there way too much. I write six days a week and have lots of content and lots of guests and fun events. And then I also am on Twitter at Simon WDC, and I'm increasingly on threads. I'm making the migration there slowly. Um, but I just want to finish by saying I want to just thank the two of you. I mean, I've said this to you privately, but I want to say it publicly, is that the courage that all of you have shown who were Republicans, who can, have not just your opposition to Trump, but the fact that you've stayed in the game, because it would have been very easy for you to have gone off and done other things, because fighting people in your own party is no fun, right? These are many of these people you know, you've worked with, their colleagues you used to have relationships with. I can't even imagine trying to do something like this in the Democratic Party. And I just want to say hats off to the two of you for your patriotism, well, you your so love of country. And it's great to be in this fight with you guys. I mean, I'm really well, proud. I, 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 you. I will tell you this, uh, Simon, you know, to that point, Rick and I were talking a few weeks ago. Um, I don't remember even how it came up, but uh, Rick said something that that has sort of stuck with me since that day, which is, you know, when you go to bed at night, 
you feel good about what you do. And you, when you wake up in the morning, you say, it might be another tough day, but at least I'm on the right side of history. You know, and, and I think that helps us keep going. All right. As as I wrap us up here, gang, um, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Reed Galen on threads and Instagram at Reed underscore Galen underscore LP and also up Substack the home front. That's the home front. Michelle, thanks for managing the air traffic control yeah, for us and take us home. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them. As they've slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Those who are lost now, their legacy must be our lives. I can hear you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Amazing grace. I am dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers. We dominate the streets. I won't traffic in fear and division. I won't fan the flames of hate. It's time to pick up our heads. Remember who we are. This is the United States of America. 